All right, welcome everyone to HED 250, um, Professional Foundations of Public Health. This is uh, chapter one, underlying concepts of the health education and promotion profession. So starting off, what are health educators? So health educators affect change and make a positive difference, okay? That's, that's what they want to do. They want to promote healthier lives for all people, and they want to understand and advocate for that change. Okay, one of the things that's really big is improving global health. That's definitely a responsibility, and global agreements and policies are definitely um, needed. So when we're talking about health, what is it? What are we talking about? Okay, so health is this, a state of balance between the mind, body, and spirit. Okay, so make sure you realize that it's mind, body, spirit. Okay. As the next definition says, health is defined as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of infirmity. Okay, So it's not simply the absence of illness. It's not simply the absence of being quote-unquote healthy. Right? It's a combination of that physical, mental, and social, which is mind, body, and spirit. Okay. So wellness is... I'm not going to just read you these definitions. I'm just going to tell you that. Uh, you can read them. But it, wellness is a concept that really looks at the quality of life that encompasses the individual. Okay? So wellness is even more than health. Okay? So it's, it's this idea that the physical, emotional, intellectual, spiritual, interpersonal, and social, environmental, et cetera, et cetera, all are in balance or all in like harmony okay so it's when all those things are together that's wellness not just again the absence of an illness okay so when you think about just a profession you know it's important to realize that a profession requires specialized knowledge and often you know requires intensive academic preparation okay so professions are different than just a job okay Professions are things that you have to study, you have to learn. So a health educator, according to the U.S. Department of Labor, works to encourage healthy lifestyles and wellness. So just like what we just talked about, that health and that lifestyle and that wellness, through educating individuals and communities. So health educators don't just focus on people or families. It's individuals, communities, everybody about behaviors that promote healthy living and prevent diseases and other health problems. So it's not just diseases, it's that other health problems. Okay, I want you to make sure you remember this. It's not just disease. Uh, the Certified Health Education Specialist, or CHES, is a national certification for the profession. If you go on to our master's program, that's um, an exam that you would definitely take. Okay, so there are tons of examples of places and settings for health educators. So they include, you know, medical care settings, colleges, universities, school, public health departments, hospitals, lots and lots of places. We're going to learn about those even more as the semester goes on. Okay, so chronic versus infectious diseases. Communicable is also known as infectious diseases are caused by some specific biological agent or toxic product that are transmitted from an infected person, animal, or an animate reservoir to a suspectable host. Okay, so infectious diseases. What's an example? Um, an infectious disease would be an STD. Okay, non-communicable or chronic diseases cannot be transmitted from an infectious host. Okay, but these are caused by lifestyle. Um, diabetes. You cannot catch diabetes. That would be an example of a chronic disease. So think of it that way. Okay. Disease concepts, so non-modifiable health disease risk factors are those factors we cannot normally change, okay? Think about things like your race, your gender, heredity, your age, your income, education. Okay, those are your, at that moment, you cannot change. Those are the things that you cannot change, okay? Um... You know, some of those things, you, you know, at that moment, if you're saying, hey, I'm trying to get healthier, but I can't change my income, right? Can't change your education immediately. 
Okay, you, you can't change your race. Okay, you can't change a disability that you may have. So semi-modifiable are those where like community, society, groups, policies, etc. They they get interventions and government interventions intercede and change things. Okay. So that may be your environment. Your access to healthcare is a perfect example. Okay. So those are things that can be changed, but a lot of times require more than just a couple days or weeks. Okay. So your modifiable health disease risk factors are those that cannot that can be changed by the person through lifestyle changes. Okay, that's risk behaviors, habits, stress, alcohol, nutrition, exercise, smoking, things like that. Okay, so things that you as an individual can change really without the help of somebody else if you choose to. Okay, we're going to look at three different models. Um, I want you to know with these models, I want you to know just the general concepts of them. Okay, so the infection model is a triangle of a communicable disease that depicts the agent, host, and environment interacting to cause an infectious disease in a person. We're going to look at these a little bit more. So the communicable disease model is the interaction of the agent, which is the disease, the host, which is the person, and environment, allowing the disease to flourish. The multi-causation communicable disease model is when diseases are caused by more than one factor or a combination of factors. Okay, so here's your communicable. So you have this triangle, okay, you have the host, the agent, and the environment. Okay, and if you go back, okay, so you have communicable disease, depict the agent, which right here we know here, agent, I should have put up here, sorry, agent is a disease, host is a person. Okay, right here. Okay, here is the next one. Okay, this is your genetics. These are things that you cannot change, okay? Your personality, beliefs, behavioral choices. These are things that, in a lot of ways, you can change, okay? This is those outside things that really you have very little control over, right? You have very little control over the water quality, the healthcare system in the town you live, air pollution. Yes, you could do things to impact them, but you don't really have control over those specific factors on a daily basis. Okay. Here's another one. Okay, so if you notice this idea here is, again, I want you just to kind of know a little bit about it. They're all, I want you to realize they're all interconnected, right? Okay. Health status is categorized as healthy, no sign or symptom of disease, illness, injury, disability. Okay. That's when you're feeling great, you don't have a cold, you don't have anything going on. Good. Non-healthy, okay, so you're infected with a disease, illness, or injury. Afflicted, okay, that's something that's like a disability impairment, your dependency as a result of disease, injury, or illness. Typically, your afflicted is not going to change, okay. This is going to be someone who has maybe a disability or an impairment, maybe they... Um, they are paralyzed, okay? Probably more than likely not going to change, okay? Death is a loss of life, okay? So health education is a multi-dimensional term that encompasses any skills from a variety of disciplines, okay? It's not just simply one, one area that you can do um, health education, okay? I want you to realize that. It's health education... We've got nurses in here, we've got speech path in here, um, healthcare management, we've got lots and lots of different individuals in here, um, which is exactly what health education is, okay? So it, it takes skills and it takes people from all these different disciplines um, to work together, okay? So a healthy lifestyle, um, is essential for every health educator. So one thing in healthy lifestyle is when you're a health educator, I want you to think about what you do is pe people are watching it. Okay. People see what you're doing. People 
replicate it. They're like, oh, but she's a health educator, and if she does it, then, you know, it's probably fine. So just, that's one thing, healthy lifestyle. I want you to kind of think about that. So your lifestyle is like, what are those things you're doing? It's those healthy behavior patterns that maximize one's quality of life and decreases one's susceptibility to negative health outcomes. Okay, so like what lifestyle activities? So that could be exercise, your eating habits, anything like that. But people are watching. Okay, that's not in your textbook. Just kind of got to throw that out there for you. Quality of life is when a person acquires a sense of satisfaction with their life and environment encompasses all aspects of a life that includes health, recreation, rights, values, benefits, beliefs, conditions, and aspirations. Okay, so your quality of life is all these things together. So quality of life is not just healthy or not healthy, okay, with or without illness. Quality of life is even more. A healthy community is more than just where you live, okay? People talk about, they're like, you know, there's places in my community that are healthy, or this is an overall healthy community. Let's talk about what is that, okay? So it's things that work together to create and improve the physical and social environments. It helps people support one another in aspects of daily life and develop to their fullest potential. Okay, so a healthy community is not just, oh, we have a um, farmer's market or we can get fresh fruits and vegetables. Those are important, but it's also, you know, things like, is there a place for people safely to go and hang out? Is there a place um, people can go maybe exercise that's safe? Um, what about air pollution? It's all these things together. Are there, you know, places people can go um to church, religious organizations, things like that. All those things make it a healthy community. Healthy places are those designed and built to improve the quality of life for all people who live, work, worship, learn, and play within their boundaries, their borders. Within a healthy community, part participation or involvement of the individuals by the members is important. Okay, so it's not just, oh, there's a park, but do people actually go to the park? Okay, if you're in Columbus, there's the river walk. Okay, perfect example. If the river walk is there, it doesn't make it a healthy community. It only makes it a healthy community if people go to the river walk. Community health education is a theory driven process that promotes health and prevents disease within populations. We're going to study more and more, especially throughout your um, time in the program, about theory driven and why that's important. But community health education really works to promote the health of the community and you know definitely all this is preventing diseases within that population as well health literacy so this is the capacity of an individual to obtain interpret and understand basic health information and services and the confidence to use such information and services in a way that are health enhancing okay why is health literacy important health literacy is one of the most important parts of health education okay an example of health literacy is when you go to the doctor's office and you're given a questionnaire, okay? A lot of these questionnaires are written at such a high level that a lot of individuals that don't have a high school degree or maybe even those that don't have a college degree have a hard time reading these, okay? Um, another example is when it's written in a different language. If their first language is Spanish and it's only available in English, that's an issue for them, okay? Another thing is like the brochures you get at doctor's offices or the pharmacy. Those are also things to think about with health literacy. Health promotion is the process of enabling people to increase control over and improve their own health, okay? So health promotion focuses on the individual and how you can help them as a health educator to promote and realize that they have control over their own health and to improve it. Health prevention, okay, it's not just about pre preventing diseases. It means practicing beneficial health behaviors, okay? So it includes actions and interventions designed to identify risk and reduce susceptibility or exposure to health threats before the disease, the onset of disease. So it's not just about that disease, but it's, it's making decisions and participating in health behaviors that reduce those risks overall. Um, example would be sexual risk taking. 
So health prevention would be not just preventing transmission of STDs and unplanned pregnancy. It would also be making sure that individuals are participating in behaviors that are healthy for them at that point in their lives. Health protection is when a person or community has a place um, available. Then health shields enable a high quality of life. Okay, so think about protection. These are just things that really help the individual to, in, to maintain that high quality of life or to establish it. Healthcare access, access to quality healthcare and disease control tools such as clinics, medical personnel, drugs, vaccines, and diagnostics is a critical health determinant of populations. Um, a really good example in Mississippi is the Delta. Um, the Delta, the healthcare access um, in the Delta is definitely lacking, and it's something that um, a lot of organizations um, are working really, really hard to improve. And some of you may be from the Delta and have experienced that. I encourage you throughout the semester when you have the opportunity to talk about that. Talk about access to care. It's a really, really big issue in Mississippi. Health enhancements and maintenance. So health enhancements and maintenance is an integral part of continuing the work of health education, even when programs may no longer be available in communities. Okay, so sustainability. Okay, so health maintenance is the everyday way that people attempt to stay well, such as proper clothing, food, and so social support. So maybe there's not all these other activities and things available to them, but they really want to focus on just at least doing the simple things in some ways we think of it, but for a lot of people it's not the simple things. Health enhancements are extraordinary measures taken above and beyond the norm to continually improve one's health. Okay, So the concept of empowerment or social action is important to health education. So these are the things that we go above and beyond. Okay, This is not just the maintenance. The maintenance is things that every day that we want to provide a lot of times kind of the basic care. Enhancements are those things that can really, really make a step above. Okay. Comprehensive school health education and coordinated school health programs. Okay, so comprehensive school health education is when formal health education is given as a core curriculum subject in public schools. This is not as common as we would like it to be. Very few schools in Mississippi have um, a comprehensive school health education curriculum. Uh, coordinated school health programs. Um, we also lack a lot of these in Mississippi, okay? So I want you guys to think about, I know some of you may not be from Mississippi, may not live here. Um, I want you to think about where you are and think about, do these things exist, okay? So the Coordinated School Health Program includes, um, but it's not limited to a healthy school environment, health education, nutrition services. That could be your free and reduced lunch. But they have breakfast services available. Um, physical education, health services, counseling. All those things, are they there? Are they within the schools? Coordinated school health program model, okay? Health education, physical education. We know a lot of PE programs and recess are being taken out of schools. Health services. I know I worked um, this summer with some nurses from Sunflower County, Mississippi, and you know, they talked about how there's only two of them for, I believe it was like seven or eight schools, okay? So that's, that's something that's lacking. Nutrition services, okay? I also worked with a counselor who said that she has about 1,200 students that she works with at a school. So the healthy school environment. Um, I've been to a school locally, not in Columbus, but locally, that um, didn't have, um, it was winter, didn't have any heat, okay? They had small heaters going. Is that something that's really safe for elementary school kids? Health promotion for staff. Are there any opportunities? Uh, family community involvement. So do they have activities for the family, the community, uh, PTA type things, uh, anything like that? Okay. So the National Health Education Standards, um, these are going to come up again later in the course. Okay. Um, these are just some examples. CDC's characteristics of effective health education curricula. CDC, CDC has a lot of things. If you don't know, CDC Centers for Disease Control is a really good resource. School, these are, um, you could be, if you wanted to work within the um, schools, school health edu school health coordinator, certified health education faculty. Um, 
Okay. There's a list. It's in your book of eight components of a coordinated school health program. Okay. Um, the Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance System is a survey that um, monitors health risk behaviors and rates for young people and adolescents. So it's a national study that's done, um, I believe, every few years, and it collects a lot of really important data for health educators to see what's going on in schools, like what schools have what and what do they need. I encourage you to look at this. Um, it's definitely something you can use later in the class as well. Okay, healthy people. Healthy people um, is done by the government. It is set out every um, 10 years, and it's really kind of like the health goals. Okay, so it's, it establishes national health objectives. Um, it serves as a template for developing state, community, professional organizations, and others as a premier plan. Okay, so uh, it's written by experts. It prevents the vision. Okay, um, 20... 10 um, has 28 focal areas. 2020 had 38. Okay, what is epidemiology? Besides just a course you have to take at some point during your program. It is the study of disease transmission in humans, including descriptive, statistic, descriptive statistics, causes, rates, risks, trends, and problem solving. So it's a study of how diseases are spread. Okay. Um, look in your textbook a little bit more about this. Okay. The cycle of poverty. Understanding that really poverty is a cycle. Okay. There's a lot of different um, reasons it's a cycle. There's a lot of different ways um, the cycle continues. Okay. Um, a big one in Mississippi of poverty is teenage pregnancy, lack of education, which can come in this preventative care at times, um, all those things. So have a general idea of the cycle of poverty. Um, personal health traditions, okay. Um, again, so personal health traditions, you have that, it is in the middle. This is things like your culture, religion, ethnicity, outward. Social, so how, how do these all work together? Okay, so this creates the unique individual, it creates you. Health determinants, epidemiology, and statistics. So, health statistics are you are the use of health indices. Okay, so when we're talking about those, these, these are statistics and health determinants. All these things are let me go back epidemiology and statistics are things that we look at as health educators to see what's going on, what's causing this potentially, what what trends do we see, okay? Um, the NIH and CDC collect a lot of these, okay? And the World Health Organization, those are three top health organizations that are always great to get information from. Okay, so what statistics do we collect, okay? We, Communicable and non-communicable, so infectious and non uh, infectious and chronic, okay. The determinants of health, the personal, social, economic, and environmental factors that determine health status, okay. Determinants of health are lots of factors that come together. So cultural components and other major factors are very significant in health determinants, okay. So culture. These are things, these are non-physical traits such as values, beliefs, attitudes, customs that are shaped by a group of people and pass from one generation to the next. So thinking about your culture, what is your culture? What what makes you you? Okay, that's a lot of your health determinants. Heritage, okay, heritage consistency includes culture, ethnicity, and religious background, which also affect your health. Measurement and rates. Okay, rates are measures of an event, disease, or condition that measures health or health status in a unit of population a long time. These are definitions I want you to basically just have a general understanding of. Okay, life expectancy, what is it? Okay, life expectancy rate is based on age specific death rates. Okay, life expectancy at birth. 
So from the time you're born is a measure used that compares the progress of health status between gender and population groups. The years of healthy life rate is a measure of life years without any disease, injury, or disability. Years of potential life lost rate is a measure of premature mortality when the age of 75 years is subtracted from the age of death. Mortality rates are death or fatality rates due to disease or injury, and most are expressed in populations per 100,000. Excess mortality rates are the differences between the number of deaths in a group and the number of expected deaths within a general population. Okay, These are those things that are just, that's why they're called excess. So the difference between the number of deaths in a group and the number of expected deaths within the general population. So why is this group having a really high mortality rate? Crude mortality rates are not good indicators of risk since these are generalized rates. Okay. These are things you're really going to spend a lot of time on in epidemiology. Um, I really want you just to have a general idea. Okay. Know the difference. Okay. Adjusted crude rates or cost specific rates are when total population rates are statistically adjusted for a certain particular population subgroup, for a particular disease or disease specific rates, for certain characteristics as age specific rates, gender, race, community, or cost specific rates. Relative risk is a measure of the association between exposure and outcome and is reported as an identified risk factor for that outcome. So that would be like a disease or injury. Morbidity refers to those affected with a disease or illness. Incidence rates are the new cases, new number of cases of people infected with a disease or illness in a specific period of time. Prevalence rates are the number of community cases at any given time. I will tell you these three definitions you need to know. Make sure you know them. Make sure you know the difference between incidence and prevalence. Morbidity versus mortality. Okay, go back a few slides and you'll see those. Okay. Prevalence rates are all, these rates are all of the causes of a specific disease among a specific group of people at a specific time period, specified time, period of time. Okay. Endemic rates are those that occur in a population regularly. Epidemic are large numbers of diseases cases not normally expected in a population. So epidemic, we had a flu epidemic last year. Okay. Pandemic are rates of diseases over a very large geographical area. Um, the plague would have been a pandemic. Incidence rates are new cases, uh, numbers within a given time. Oh, I gave you that one twice. That might mean you should pay attention. Sporadics are cases appearing irregularly so that you know, just it pops up here and there okay sporadic could be measles we see a few cases of measles here and there okay note you're not going to be doing any um, calculations but do have a general idea of what these are but no no um, calculations we needed so neonatal Mortality, no, it's a number of deaths under 20 day, 28 days of age. Okay. Disability. Sorry, catching up on my notes. Okay. Disability measures are expressed in terms of healthy life rate loss and survival rates. Okay. So we talked earlier about what is that healthy life rate. Okay. That was a few slides ago. Um, disability is is looking at that okay so someone who maybe is a um, who's paralyzed now that would look at that okay what age did they become paralyzed that's how you would calculate it the disability adjusted life years or years lived with disability okay just like I mentioned indicates the number of years a person is afflicted with a disabling condition Fairly new measure is disability adjusted life expectancy or healthy life expectancy. It's estimated from the t life tables and adjusted with estimates for disability and other non-fatal 
health outcomes to indicate the healthy survival rate of those living with a disability. Okay, so that's looking at those that have the disease or disability um, versus those who don't and how long they're expected to live. So using this example, I sorry, I'll go back to this slide, would be someone who is um, paralyzed, has a shorter life expectancy, depending on where their paralysis is, um, and any other injuries, typically has a shorter life expectancy, that, so that would be an example, okay? Um, here your incidence rates, prevalence rates, don't worry about the attack rate right now. Leading causes of death. Know the 10 leading causes of death, okay? Have a general idea. Not in order, not specific, um, but be able to recognize them. Okay, talked about this a little bit, the national health surveys. Um, these are some examples. Be familiar with these. I'm not gonna read them to you. Have a general idea of what they are um, and who they target, okay? Leading causes of death in the United States in 2006. So why why do I tell you first these health surveys? Okay, a lot of these health surveys are how we get this information. Okay, so have a general idea of the leading causes of death in the U.S. That was 20, 2006. Um, you know, really it hasn't changed very much. Okay. So you know, wrapping up this first chapter. Okay, um, make sure you know what cultural sensitivity is. So it's respect and tolerance. Okay. Cultural sensitivity, knowing um, and respecting other people's culture and their beliefs and traditions and how that might impact their health decisions and how as a health educator you need to come in and recognize and understand them. And maybe it's bringing in a stakeholder. Um, a stakeholder would be someone who is already in the community and has a role in the community and has a point in your program okay and having them come in and help you with the cultural sensitivity okay the world health report recommends a response to the challenges of a changing world and narrowing the gap between aspirations and reality so that's one thing we always need to focus on just even as students and as people you know narrowing that gap between what are our aspirations and what is actually reality for us in this moment and helping people within their health to understand that um, the report recommends that all countries secure healthy communities through public policy reform, universal coverage reform with access and service protection, service delivery reforms centered on people's needs and expectations, and remodel leadership reform for health around more effective government and more active participation of the stakeholders. Okay. So this has been just chapter one, um, general idea here of what is health education, what all does it encompass. I know for a lot of you this is a lot of information, it's a lot of it's new. Um, take your time, go back and rewatch if you need to, uh, make sure you're reading your chapter and doing your assignments, and if you have questions, please, please, please let me know. Talk to you later.